If you want to take just a second and push your plates aside, find your Bible and your notebook. We are ready to continue in our study in Nehemiah. So this is Nehemiah, Big Calling, Bigger God. We're seeing how Nehemiah used wisdom and courage in order to accomplish the big things that God gave him in an effort to find wisdom and courage both that we can use to accomplish the things that God gives us in our daily lives. We are coming now to the conclusion of the book, the very last chapter, but even inside of that chapter, we are now kind of moving into uh, the very last section of it, the postscript almost, as we will talk about in chapter 13. And so uh, all has been accomplished. Uh, so the Nehemiah has heard about the destruction in Jerusalem. He's come back. He's led in a, a concerted and focused effort to rebuild the wall, which they accomplished in record time. They turn their attention to reestablishing worship, to reestablishing the festivals, to reestablishing uh, a priority of God's word to reestablishing worship in the temple along with uh, the mechanisms that enabled that, the uh, reestablishing the families and people that would lead in those, reestablishing the giving mechanisms that would fund those. Then they have come and finally after all of that was done, they turned their attention to repopulating the city, making sure that there was ample people within it to uh, fulfill in the societal aspects that they needed to do as a city. And then once all of that was done, uh, they had a wonderful celebration of dedicating the wall. And that's kind of where we just came off of in chapter 12. And then we turn our attention to chapter 13 and we start with um, kind of a, a transitional um, phrase there at the beginning where they once again commit themselves to separating themselves from the pagan cultures that are around them. And then now in verse 4, we hit kind of a, a major transition point. Uh, and we will stay here in this section kind of, so here through the very end of the chapter is kind of the closing words of Nehemiah, the postscript, if you will, that actually takes place some years later. And we'll unpack that in just a second when we get to that verse. So turn your attention with me to verse 4. It says, Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where he had previously put the grain offering and the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given to the command, by the commandment to the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. So here in verse 4, it's, it's kind of hard to tell in the English, but in the Hebrew it becomes apparent that we've made a transition back to first-person narrative. So remember throughout the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra were originally one book. Uh, it was a book that was probably compiled by Ezra. He was a scribe by trade. And we can see throughout the two books that there are times when uh, Ezra is sharing from his first-person experience. There's times where he's pulling um, from records, both Jewish Jewish records and Persian records, and then there's many times where we're pulling directly from um, Nehemiah's first person writing, his private diary, if you will, his journal. And so here in chapter, or in verse 4, we've kind of been third person for a while, Ezra giving this commentary, but here in verse 4, it becomes apparent in the Hebrew that we're going back to first person. So these are um, Nehemiah's personal notes uh, on what happened. So it appears here in verse 4 that we find out that Nehemiah's chief enemy, Tobiah, who has been the thorn in his flesh uh, through the entire book, uh, anytime there was conflict, we either find uh, Tobiah at the front leading the charge or at the back driving the charge. And here again, we find out that uh, he has not gone silent. He has just gone into the shadows. He's moved into more um, subtle undermining work. We knew it's a couple of things to remember about Tobiah. So we remember that Tobiah is an Ammonite, um, but we remember from chapter two that Tobiah has a very prominent Jewish name. And so he's taken on a Jewish identity, even though that's not his um, cultural heritage. We remember from chapter three that he's used re his relationships to kind of um, insert himself into the top tiers of Jewish culture. He married uh, the daughter of a very prominent leadership family among the officials and his son, he married uh, him off or rather he took a bride from another prominent family. So he's used marriage as a way to interject himself into the top tier 
of the culture. Uh, And then we learn from chapter 6 that that enabled him to kind of find his way even as an outsider, if you will, uh, into the ear of some of the most influential leaders and officials around the city. And so now we see that he has used all of those as a way to get himself literally inserted into the very heart of worship, into the very temple. Incidentally, it's important coming off of the first three verses in this chapter, if you remember, if you back up and look up, those first three verses were a reminder that at some point um, the people here in Jerusalem had committed themselves again to separating themselves from the pagan cultures around them, and they specifically announce there that they're going to separate themselves from the Ammonites, who Tobiah is one. And so we see here almost immediately this kind of crumbling of these promises that will become a theme of the rest of this chapter. Um, But here they haven't separated themselves from him, um, but literally they have allowed him to to worm his way uh, into the very presence, uh, having a vacation home, if you will, in the very temple itself, into the temple courts. Now, this was uh, an incredible act uh, because typically nobody lived in the temple permanently. Uh, The priest would have rooms there, but most all of it was set aside for worship, for storing the implements of worship. And here we see in this commentary from Nehemiah uh, that that stuff had to be removed in order to make a room out of one of these warehouse rooms for Tobiah. The subtlety and audacity of this move is hard to underestimate. How slowly Tobiah must have moved over the years, but ultimately he set his feet into the very place where God's implements of worship were set. You can only imagine um, that that's the way that sin often works. It often works very slowly, making its way into the places that it shouldn't be until it has literally replaced the acts of worship in our life. It's also worth noting here that even the most godly leaders can sometimes lose their way. Remember that this Eliashib, who's the high priest here, this is the same man that literally kicked off the revival, the reform, if you will, as he dedicated the very first gate that they rebuilt. This is the same Eliashib that led in this parade around the wall that we read about in the last chapter, and yet now here, he, because Tobiah has somehow married, he somehow, Tobiah has somehow established a relational connection, we're not told exactly what, into Eliashib's family, he opens the door for this opportunity, lets down his guard, if you will, and he allows this outsider a place in the temple. Not just allowing him to come in, but it says that they made the room. Literally, the, the Levites themselves were forced to move all this furniture so that this outsider could come in. So we go on in verse 6, and it says, While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. And so here we have some weird kind of timeline things happening uh, in the first part of this chapter. Um, It goes on, it says, While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king. And so we have, like I said, some kind of timeline gymnastics that we have to do here uh, in the coming out of chapter 12 into the first part of chapter 13 and now to this point. But it kind of becomes apparent um, that through the course of this, uh, the this dedication of the walls that we talked about in chapter 12, uh, we understand that that happened probably within about four months of Nehemiah coming to the city uh, because we know that he came. It was not very long before um, they initiated the rebuilding effort. Uh, That only took them a couple of months. Only a couple of more months go by as they celebrate, they read God's word, they kind of reenact um, all of these principles and activities. They commit themselves. Uh, If you remember, they all sign their names kind of to a, a new commitment to God's word word and his standards. All of that happened within just about four or five months at the most of Nehemiah coming. But we know then that Nehemiah was governor uh, over the area for about 12 years. Uh, And so this point here in verse four picks up. So the first three verses, we end chapter 12 right there within the first few months of Nehemiah being there. Uh, The first few verses of chapter 13, where they recommit themselves to to purity, relational purity, if you will, happen sometime in the in-between. And then here in verse four, we're picking up some 12 to 13 years after 
the uh, Nehemiah originally comes to Jerusalem. So we are decade plus removed from the rebuilding of the wall. And so Nehemiah serves his terms uh, as governor. We think from extra biblical literature that we find that he probably served two terms uh, as the governor of this satrap. And remember, that's kind of a, a region uh, of division uh, among the Persian government. And so he serves as the governor there for a couple of terms, and then he goes back to the king. Now remember, that was a promise that he had made way back in chapter 2. When the king gave him leave, he promised that he would come back eventually. Um, and so this is part of that promise of going back to the king. And remember that Susa, the capital for Persia, and Jerusalem are separated by probably three to four months of travel distance at this time. Um, and so he goes back, he spends some amount of time, we're not really sure, uh, back in the king's court, and then he begins to hear again about what's happening in Jerusalem. Uh, and so he is again forced to come back to try to rectify some of the things that are happening in Jerusalem. In his absence, ever how short of a time that was, in his absence, God's people have begun to violate all of the promises that they made under his initial reform. So remember that the restoration of the wall brought with it a reforming of faith. It brought with it also a revival among the people uh, where they got back into God's word. They began to see clearly what was there and they began to respond to the commandments to the point where as an entire city... With their leaders first, they sign their name to a commitment to say, listen, we are going to uphold the things that we see in God's law. And some of the specific things that they called out were that we're going to continue to give our tithes and support uh, financially to the temple and to the Levites and to the priests. We're going to honor the Sabbath by um, setting it aside for worship and not for commerce. We're going to honor our relational status and separate ourselves from the pagan cultures that are trying to influence us. And yet here in the, through this chapter, we're going to see that all of those, they're turning their back on one right after another. And so Nehemiah is coming back in kind of a last ditch effort to try to deal uh, with all of these issues. History, the, specifically the history of God's people, and I don't mean just in the Old Testament or just in the New Testament. I mean over uh, the, the 5,000 some years uh, of Christian history that we have, there's a distressing and often depressing truth that our heartfelt passion and sincere devotion is often short-lived. We make big promises, but sometimes we are very short on fulfilling those. And chapter 13 is a clear example of this. We can see that, remember that, are, it helps us to remember here that these words that we're reading right here in chapter 13, because of this time lapse, if you will, um, between chapter 12 and chapter 13, that the chapter 13 here of Nehemiah, or literally the very last words that were written in the Old Testament from a timeline perspective. And so here, this is kind of where we are left off before God goes silent, if you will, 400 years of silence before he will pick back up with his revelation in his son and begin to set right some of these issues. It's also worth noting, because it'll come up here in just a minute, that it was during this um, blackout period we have between chapter 12 and chapter 13 that the prophet Malachi comes back and writes his book uh, of prophecy and prophetic warning to God's people. And we've been studying that on Sunday morning in our offering time, and we'll come, we'll talk more about that specifically in just a second. So we pick up here in chapter in verse seven and continue. And it says, um, and I came to Jerusalem and then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. And then I gave orders and they cleansed the chamber. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. This makes evident again, again, just the audacity and self-centeredness of Tobiah. I am sure that he was sickly satisfied at seeing his own personal belongings um, in this room that was intended for the implements of God, seeing his picture maybe even hung on the wall of this room that was supposed to be set aside for worship. And it put him in the very heart of the city, a place where he could make the most issues, where he could raise the most concerns, he could make the most waves, he could cause the most trouble. I think it's important for us that we make sure that we are watching out for these wolves in sheep's clothing, as they are called sometimes in Scripture. We understand that 
Today's church is not immune to these type of outsiders coming in looking to um, cause friction, to dissuade, to disrupt the worship of God. And I think there's some flags, some red flags that we see here in Tobiah that we can still use to help us identify some of these wolves, maybe, in sheep's clothing in uh, our churches today. First, we have to look out for people that prioritize their own comfort and preferences over true worship. You think about Tobiah, he came in and all he was concerned about was his comfort, right? I need this chamber cleared for, for, for me. I mean, that's not far off from somebody coming into a worship service on Sunday morning going, listen, I need y'all to take out these three pews because I'm going to bring a recliner and set it right over here. And I need some extra space for that because what's important really is not worship. What's important is my comfort in worship, right? And obviously that's an extreme example, but we have to be watching even for that subtly of people that prioritize their preferences over true worship. Second, we need to be on the lookout for people that try to move their way into leadership that has not been earned. Too often, to, what Tobiah here, he wanted to come in and he was trying to set himself into a place of influence in an area that he had earned no right. He wasn't a Levite. He wasn't even a Jew. He, he hadn't put in the time of leading and, and, and studying and, and, and establishing himself as a leader. He just wanted to come in and have all of that authority, right, without any of that work. And so we have to be looking out for that as well. We have to be looking out for people that want to come in and they immediately want to come in and, you know, they've been here two weeks and they're ready to teach a Sunday school class, right? They haven't established themselves. They, they, haven't, they haven't put in, in, in the work of the people, if you will. They, ha- they haven't done the things that they needed to do, yet they want the leadership without having put in uh, the investment The third thing is we need to look out for people that try to move into places of influence outside of the normally established channels. Now, this is very similar to the one that we just talked about, but we see here again that Tobiah not only wanted to to have that influence without any of the work, but he also wanted to come in from the side, right? I mean, there were established channels on how we pick um, people in the temple, how we pick the Levites and the gatekeepers. There, There were mechanisms for that to happen, and yet he didn't want to worry about any of those, right? He wanted to come in and make his own way right up to the top. And so likewise, we have to be cautious of people that come in and and they see the the things that we do. They see who we are as a church, but they have a better way, right? We ought to just do it this way. I just need to do it this way. And we have to be cautious of that. And then finally, of course, number four, we have to be cautious of people that want to use kingdom resources for their own gain. People that want to use kingdom resources for their own gain. So they're not worried about the church as a whole. They're worried about themselves and themselves only. And again, that's very similar to the first one. They prioritize their comfort. But here, not only are they worried more about their comfort, but they want to see church resources used for their own gain. So the application question here is we think about those four aspects. The application question for us is we have to look inwardly and we have to, yes, be cautious and be looking for outside wolves in sheep's clothing, but we understand that we are sinners at our own heart. And so the application for us is we have to turn inward and ask ourselves, is there a wolf raising its head in my own life? And so we have to ask ourselves, are we guilty of prioritizing our own comfort over true worship? Are we guilty of going in and saying, my preferences are more important than true worship? We see this so often in worship style, right? Like they didn't sing that song the way I wanted it sung today. And we're not concerned about the truth that is proclaimed. We're not concerned about what the Spirit's doing. We're just concerned about how loud the drums were maybe, right? Uh, and there's, those are things to be considered. We want to create an environment that's conducive for worship for everybody. But we have to be con- conscious of our own hearts, making sure that we're just not prioritizing our preferences over true scriptural worship. We also have to look in and ask ourselves, are we trying to move into leadership that has not been earned or appointed, right? Are we openly criticizing um, some aspect of the church that we really have no contact with, right? Are we looking and, and openly criticizing maybe the stewardship team over the way they made a decision for something when we're not any a part of the stewardship team? The church has, has elected a group of people to, to, to give oversight, to, to make policies, to, 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 to dictate things. They bring things to the church, and, and we're not a part of that. We haven't tried to be a part of that. We don't want to follow those channels. We just want to complain and make our opinion. Are we guilty of trying to move into places of influence outside of normal channels? 
Are we guilty of finding ourselves just going uh, around things, right? I think often one of the ways that we see this is are we um, complaining about things without going to maybe the pastor or the director, right? And so do we, is there something in the children's area that, that we're, we're not happy about? And instead of going to Sherry and saying, hey, can you explain this to me? We just go complain over here, right? Or we go talk to this, this parent over here. And we begin to go around these channels that God has established. And then finally, are we using kingdom resources for our own comfort? Are we constantly taking but never giving into worship? And I'm not talking about just financially. I'm talking about uh, relationally, emotionally, spiritually. Do we come in looking to be just a consumer in worship? Are we coming in to be a worshiper, to add into worship? And we have to ask ourselves those very difficult questions sometimes. And when we see these things happening, our reaction should be the same as Nehemiah's was here. Nehemiah became very angry. In fact, I like the King James translation here better. He was, it grieved me bitterly is what he said. I think I like that more than anger. Like we see anger as kind of this flaring up, right, of emotion, but this grieve, we understand grieving is, is, is part of a loss. And here what he sees is the loss of the integrity of worship and that grieves him, the death of that and, and bitterly to the point where it doesn't taste right in his mouth to see it. Right? It makes him uncomfortable to see Tobiah here in this area. And there are a couple of reasons, I think, why it was so distressing to Nehemiah. First, it grieved him because these rooms in the courts of the temple of God were being occupied by a man who was not only a pagan, but also had a history of actively opposing God's work in the days of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah saw Tobiah for exactly what he was, a wolf in sheaves clothing. And so, of course, that grieved him. I think it also grieved him because it reflected so badly on Eliashib, right? Eliashib is supposed to be the leader of the house of God right now. He's supposed to be doing things that are not prioritizing him or his family in this case, but prioritizing God's word and God's spirit among the people. He should have been sacrificing everything of himself, and yet he wasn't. And so I think it grieved Nehemiah to see um, that this reflected so badly, so poorly on Eliashib. It showed that if Eliashib was blind to this problem area, there was also other things that he was probably blind to. Third, I think it probably grieved Nehemiah because it made Nehemiah question the lasting value of the spiritual revival that he had witnessed when he was last in Jerusalem. I can only imagine that it grieved him because here in seeing this, he saw this as a, a, a litmus test of the overall commitment of the people. And here are these people that had been so committed, literally giving their blood, sweat, and tears uh, into the vision of reestablishing the city, reestablishing the temple, reestablishing worship, making all these strong commitments. All of a sudden, they're beginning to wane away. And I can imagine as a leader that that probably broke his heart. And so he reacted in a very visceral way. He came in and literally threw out all the household goods of Tobiah. I love that. I can just see him wrecking the room, can't you? Running in and just picking up chairs and taking them out and just throwing them out in the hallway. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, and the, the people just standing there and going, it just in that awkward silence of, is Nehemiah okay? Like, I wonder what happened to him when he was back in Susa. Uh, he must, the journey must have wore on him, right? He must still be tired, bless his heart, from his journey. No, he was overcome with a righteous anger. He threw all of Tobiah's household goods out uh, of this room that he occupied so that he could clear it back for the court. Not only did he do that, but then he had them come in, and I love this, they ceremonially cleansed the room. That word cleanse there is not like a wiping down, right? They didn't go in and dust things. This isn't that type of cleaning. This is a cleansing that has with it um, the connotation of a ceremonial, a spiritual aspect. They went in and cleansed out this evil, right? They dedicated this room again. And then, of course, then he puts back this room to its proper use, a storeroom for the sacred things of the temple. This reminds us very vividly, or at least it should, of another man that came in and in a righteous anger cleared out some of the temple. You remember Jesus, who later cleansed the temple from those that were simply there to profane it. Those that were there as wolves in sheep's clothing, looking for personal gain over true worship, right? Those money changers, they weren't there because they cared about worship. They were there to try to turn a profit. They were there to try to cheat the people. They were there in a place that they shouldn't have been. 
And Jesus comes in and he's not worried about being nice. He's not worried about hurting feelings. He's worried about the integrity of a holy place. And so he comes in and in a righteous anger, he takes bold action. He makes a whip, if you remember. This, this wasn't an emotional reaction that Jesus had, right? He didn't just come in and just lose his, his temper, right? He came in, and scripture tells us very specifically, he went and he made a whip. Now, I've never made a whip, but I can imagine that that is something that didn't happen quickly. I would imagine that's something that took some time to find some supplies, to sit down and to make out this whip, whatever that looked like. And then he went in and he cleansed the things. Nehemiah and stands in stark contrast to many of the other leaders that were around him at the time who were willing to concede on these holy issues, and yet he was not willing to negotiate when holiness was at stake. So the application question that's obvious to us is, are we willing to confront sin? Does the defilement of God's work make us this fired up? When we see somebody that's one of those wolves in sheep's clothing, whether intentionally or unintentionally, right? Sometimes we, we put those sins, like Tobias sins off on these people, like when we talk about wolves in sheep clothing, sometimes we put that off on like this, this evil character from the movies, right? And he's over in the side kind of plotting and he's, he's got dark fangs when nobody's looking and a big smile when everybody's looking. But sometimes it's the sin in our own hearts that rears up and even a good person like Eliashib can find himself making poor decisions. We have to ask ourselves when that happens, are we willing to confront it or do we just nod at it? When we hear somebody complaining about something or, or grumbling about something, do we call them out and say, listen, have you talked to the pastor about that? Have you talked to your deacon about that? Have you questioned God's word about that? Are we willing to confront that sin, especially when it comes to the defilement of God's work through his house? Verse 10 goes on and it says, I also found out that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. And so I confronted the officials, and I said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together, and I set them in their stations. So now not only has he realized that they have been replacing the proper use of some of these areas in the temple, but we're seeing that that's trickling down. Remember it told us, that part of the function of this room, that to, this warehouse room that Tobiah had taken over his own personal chambers, part of the purpose of it was the storing of the gifts for the Levites. And so all of a sudden they've cleared that out, right? They've prioritized Tobiah over that. And so I can imagine the people looking and going, well, gosh, I guess they don't really care about um, the, the Levites and the priests. I'm not going to worry about giving my tithe if that's how they're going to use it. And so the, the, the giving has dried up. And so remember that these Levites and these gatekeepers, there's, there's no, the, the temple doesn't have investments that they're pulling off of, right? They're completely dependent, like our church is dependent on, of the gifts of the people. And so when the people stop giving, the Levites stop receiving. And so these Levites that are supposed to be there leading in worship, what does it say they did? They went back home and started working in the field because they had to feed their family. They had to feed themselves. And so the worship here is also falling apart. The people didn't obey God's word regarding the giving that they remember had specifically committed themselves to. And so because of the lack of the port, the lack of the support, they had to go back and forsake their service to God and go back and find ways to earn money. But Nehemiah sees the deeper problem here, right? This is definitely an issue that God's leaders don't have the money that they need to be here and lead. But he sees it for the deeper issue. Why is the house of God forsaken? The lack of giving was a way of forsaking the house of God. It wasn't just unhelpful that the Levites and the singers weren't there. It was a way of turning their backs on God, of turning their backs on worship. There's a unique balance of faithfulness that exists in tithing. When we're talking about giving, you remember that was part of what we're talking about here, this giving into um, the, 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 um, the needs of the temple, this tithing. But there's a unique balance to be found in that, and we see that in the prophets. Because if you go back to the prophet Amos, so the prophet Amos, <clears throat> if you hold him, 
on one end and you hold the prophet Malachi on the other end, you kind of begin to see these two extremes and these two extremes lived out or um, shown out in the lives of Israel. So Amos was a prophet that prophesied to Israel before the exile. So remember now, Nehemiah is coming back from the exile. Um, and so God, as a judgment on his people, scattered them. And as a mercy to his people, he has now regathered them. So Amos was a prophet before they were scattered. And Malachi, as we said, um, prophesied here literally in this very moment, right? Um, literally in this time between when um, Nehemiah left and came back, he's prophesying. And so when you look at the words of these two prophets, you see that Amos was condemning the people. He was chastising the people because they were giving lavish gifts but they were doing it in a superstitious way in an attempt to bribe God. And so they were giving large amounts, but they were doing it not out of faithfulness, but out of a way to try to bribe God. Here, at this moment, Malachi, and we've been studying this uh, in worship, um, in our offering time over the last couple of months. Malachi says, why are you robbing God? Because now the people have turned to a different extreme, and now they're not giving at all. And so as believers, we have to find that balance between understanding that faithfulness calls us to give, but it calls us to give in accordance with an outpouring of gratitude, not in a way to try to bribe God's hand or move his hand. We must be sure that we're giving out of faithfulness, but we're also giving faithfully. So we're giving with the right heart, but we're also giving in the right way. The promises of chapter 10, just a few chapters ago, to support the house of God are completely hollow without the consistency of those gifts. And that's what we see. They're just empty promises when the people don't follow through in that giving. So we're going to pause right there and we'll come back and see Nehemiah's reaction to this second issue that identifies itself. And then we'll continue to work our way through the rest of the chapter over the next couple of weeks. Bow with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the challenge that it brings to us, God. Fathers, we remember the sanctity of your body. Father, that just as the temple was a sacred place set aside specifically for you, Father, we understand now that the church, not this building, but this people, are a people that are holy, sacred, and set aside for your work. And so, Father, any time that we see that that work is being sidetracked by men, Father, make us bold, bold as Nehemiah, bold as Jesus, to call those things out. And Father, of course, we ask that you help us to be true worshipers, worshipers that give faithfully, that give consistently. Father, that come in and look not to our own preferences, but to add to your kingdom, to worship in a way that makes you famous, that exemplifies your gloriness and draws attention to it and away from us. And Father, may that be how we move through the rest of even this Easter season. And God, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.